that. Okay, these videos are, are for Christmas and also for the fourth week of Advent. So we're, we're going to start with the, the readings for the fourth week of Advent, and then we will get into the readings for uh, Christmas. So what we're going to do is instead of reading uh, every single reading, um, how about if I go through and just discuss it, and you can you can add comments? Would that be okay? That's fine. So that way we can hit we can hit a few more readings. So, so we begin with our prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless us, especially as we prepare for the last week of Advent and also for the celebration of Christmas. Help us, Lord, to preach the Word in a very inspired way this weekend, in a special way. Awaken in the hearts of your your faithful a desire to live the faith. We pray, especially for the many who will be coming back to church for the first time, that there would be true transformation in their lives. We ask this all through Christ our Lord, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, so this this uh, very first reading that we have today for the fourth week of Advent, it comes from 2 Samuel chapter 7, one of the most famous readings in the Old Testament. It's known as the dynastic promise. The promise that David would have an eternal kingdom, always one of his, his descendants, would be upon the throne. Mm -hmm. The church understands that this dynastic promise is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, our Lord, who reigns forever and ever. A descendant of David, born of the virgin, true man and true God. So David received the promise after he had conquered Jerusalem from the Jebusites. And after he had brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, you can find that in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and 2 Samuel chapter 6. And so it says that David was settled in his palace and he had rest from his enemies on every side. This is actually a promise that goes back to the, Deuteron to the book of Deuteronomy that God would give his people rest from their enemies on every side. And so in a sense, it kind of shows God is fulfilling his promises. The Lord is faithful to fulfill his promises. And in that context, God makes another promise to David. And so the prophet that comes to David is Nathan the prophet. You might remember that Nathan came to David for this great promise, and only four chapters later, he will come again to David and talk about the Bathsheba incident. Hmm. So here's David exclaiming, I live in this house of cedar. And the ark of God dwells in a tent. The beautiful thing about the background to this promise is David looked at what he had, and he looked at what he was giving to God. And it was like that David was saying, you know, I, I give so much to myself, but I'm not giving mu much to the Lord. I should do more for the Lord. Um, and so, uh, and, and so, you know, there's something beautiful here, I think, that we can all look at. What are we giving to God? What are we giving to the Lord? especially in Christmas where we receive so many gifts, um, or we might be giving out a lot of gifts, but what are we giving to God? So Nathan answered the king and he said, do whatever you have in mind. It almost reminds us a little bit of Mary's words uh, to the people uh, at the wedding feast of Cana when they said, we're, we're out of wine, do whatever he tells you. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, he says, do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that night, the Lord spoke to Nathan and said, go tell my servant David. Notice how God calls David his servant. It's a very special title in the Old Testament. There's only a few people who are called God's servant. It's really a special designation. And he goes and he says, should you build me a house to dwell in? It's a rhetorical comment about the temple. The tabernacle and the future temple would be called the house of God. But the true house of God, really, nobody can build a house for the Lord. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 8, in 1 Kings chapter 8, we see this idea expressed where, where God, you know, says that, you know, even the highest of heavens, I'm sorry, Samuel says that even the highest of heavens cannot contain you, Lord. How should I build a house for you? That's 1 Kings chapter 8. So while the temple was called the house of God and the tabernacle the house of God, the understanding was that even the heavens themselves could not contain the Lord. And so it was I who took you from the pasture and from the care of the flock to be commander of my people Israel. 
I have been with you wherever you went. It reminds us of Moses. Do you remember the promise that God gave to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12? I will be with you. Uh, and he goes on, and, he, and, he, and the Lord explains that I will fix a place for my people, and I will plant them that they, they, that so that they may dwell in their place without further disturbance. And so he goes on, and he explains, I will give you rest from all your enemies. Now, did Israel have rest from all their enemies? Well, for a little while, but, you know, the kings that followed <coughs> David and Solomon, they most of them were not good kings. So what happened is when they, you know, did not follow the covenant, they did not have rest from their enemies. And even the good kings, if you look at Hezekiah and Josiah, really, you know, they were, they never really had a complete rest either. So this promise of having rest from all your enemies, it never really reaches fulfillment during the monarchy. Uh, and he goes on and he says that the Lord reveals to, to you that he will establish a house for you. Now, what is this all about? Um, there's actually two houses that are being spoken of here. One house is the temple. The other house is a dynasty. So God is, is explaining that he will establish a house for David. And that is the dynasty. It will be known as the house of David, a uh, key terminology to understand the dynasty. And when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your heir after you, sprung from your loins, and I will make his kingdom firm, and I will be a father to him. So in context, this was talking about Solomon. God would make Solomon's kingdom firm. Solomon would enjoy prosperity, and God would be like a father to the king. It's a beautiful image of the king is almost like a, an adopted son, so close to God. What a beautiful image. Um, and there's much theology in this as well, where the king had this like special relationship with the Lord as almost an adopted son, and God was a father to him. And he shall be a son to me. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me, and your throne shall stand firm forever. So the early church, they got the message of this. They, they understood that God was promising David an eternal kingdom. There would always be a descendant of David on his throne. And that descendant who fulfills this promise is Christ, our Lord. Only through the Christ, through the Messiah, our Lord Jesus, true God and true man, is this promise actually realized in the fullest way? Uh, any thoughts on this first reading, uh, Deacon Randy? Um, <laughs> yeah. When I was reading this uh, a couple days ago, I was just reading it just to get started and get some, just start jotting down some wild ideas that I was coming up with. I said, David is kind of like uh, a lot of us in the sense that uh, – uh, if you want to make God laugh, tell him what your plans are. And uh, this is exactly it, because David said, oh, I'm going to build you a house. Yeah, like uh, like he he's already built a house. It just comes to my mind that he's already built a house in each and every one of us. It's called the heart. It's called the soul. That's the room that God dwells in. Um, uh, so that's, that's just kind of my thoughts. And the other thought I had was uh, kind of reminded me a little bit about the movie Field of Dreams. Build it and he will come. Mm. And uh, uh, David is trying to build a house for the Lord. I don't know whether but he's already got the Lord with him. So how mm. I wonder how many times we don't realize God is right there with us every step of the way, mm. especially during troubled times. Okay, but those are my good. thoughts. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. There's a lot to say here. You know, there's there's so much about the theology of the temple, the theology of God's presence and and. and uh, Exactly. It's it's helping the ancient Israelites to really understand what does it mean that God dwells with you, that God is with you. And of course, the tabernacle and the temple, of course, God was with his people, but, but with limitations. There was only so close that the high priest could go once a year, the priest could go, that men could go, that women could go, that Gentiles or foreigners could go. 
They could only get so close. If you were ritually impure, you couldn't get close at all. Uh, and so what's amazing is it's teaching his people about purity and God's closeness and what it means to be holy. And, and then when Jesus comes, suddenly he comes and he establishes a new covenant with us. All the barriers are taken down in this old covenant. And now God is truly dwelling, not just close, but he dwells in us. He's with us and he dwells in us. And that's just something amazing to think about, that, that the entire church is formed together as a holy temple. Uh, so this concept of building the house of God, building the temple, it's, it's a very profound concept that gets developed throughout the entire Old Testament. Uh, and then Peter explains that each one of us is a living stone in the temple of God. Or Paul says to the Ephesians in chapter 2 that you're no longer strangers or sojourners, but you know, each of us is a member of the household of God. So something very profound. Um, and so now we go to the we go to the Psalm. Uh, psalm 89 is once again, it's a psalm that underlines the importance of the Davidic promise, the covenant that God made to David. Uh, and so in a very special way, it says, the promises of the, the promises of the Lord I will sing forever. Notice that the emphasis is on God keeps his promises. Through all generations, my mouth shall proclaim your faithfulness. For you have said, my kindness is established forever. Now, the word for kindness is a special word in Hebrew. It's the word chesed. And the word chesed is often associated with God's covenant faithfulness, his faithfulness to his promises. And so it's very difficult to translate it. It could be translated steadfast love, kindness, mercy, merciful kindness. Um, but your chesed is established forever. And notice what he says, in heaven, you have confirmed your faithfulness, not just on earth, but you've confirmed it in heaven. And he goes on, he says, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, forever I will confirm your posterity. I will establish your throne for all generations. Now, what's important about this psalm is to remember how the psalms were sung together in liturgical worship. Uh, these were communal acts of praise, even though many of them were written by David. And you can just imagine the Israelites throughout generations singing these words, your throne is established forever. I, you know, I have sworn to David, my servant, forever I will confirm your posterity and establish your throne for all generations. And this is what's amazing. For 600 years before Jesus came, six uh, centuries, there was no Davidic king, no visible Davidic king. From about the year 609 or 606, all the way to the birth of Christ, no visible Davidic king in Israel. That's really amazing. Well, you, you could say that the Maccabees were king. Maccabeans were kings, but they were not Davidic descendants, okay? So uh, that didn't take away that problem. And so you can just imagine the Israelites worshiping and singing these psalms together, but at the same time saying, where is it? Where is this Davidic king? Uh, and that, that helps us to really understand the excitement about Jesus in the New Testament. And look what he says. He shall say to me, you are my father, my God, my rock, my savior. Forever I will maintain my kindness towards him, and my covenant with him stands firm. Now, it appears that, he's, that the psalm is talking about David right here. It appears that he's talking about David. You know, that God is saying that my covenant with you will always stand firm. And these are important words because the Israelites, they, they were taken into exile. The northern kingdom was destroyed in 722. The southern kingdom destroyed in 587. They were taken to exile in Babylon. Um, and I like to just say that all they had was the promises of God. They lost everything. And all they had was God's promise that God would one day give them an eternal Davidic kingdom, promise that's fulfilled in Christ. Any thoughts about this, uh, Deacon? Mm, it, it just strikes me that it, it, it's a perfect flow from the first reading. Um, yes. Specifically talking about the, the the promises to David, and it, it's being re, it's being reiterated in this psalm. Right. Obviously, not a psalm that David wrote. 
uh, well, well, it's a good question. It's it's actually a good question be, because um, some of the a number of the psalms are attributed to David, um, but that brings up a, a a much more complex question of, you know, how do we understand if a psalm is attributed to David? Because the way that it, it's written in Hebrew, it could even it could either mean for David, or by David. So was it by David? Did he write it? Or was it simply written for David? Uh, and, and so the Hebrew is a little bit obscure um, in, in regards to exact Davidic uh, authorship, even though traditionally there's a sense that, you know, David wrote many Psalms. The first uh, two books, if you look at the end of 72, Psalm 72 at the very end, it has a note and it says that, you know, this is the end of the Psalms of David. Um, and you know, so it, it, it becomes even more complex because even the order of the Psalter, even the order of the Psalms was probably not even completely established until right around the time of Christ. Uh, so the five books, it's divided into five books in Hebrew. Um, a lot of scholars will say that that was really just being hashed out right around the time that Jesus was born. Uh, very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So... Just one yeah, other but, thing. I, you know, I said this obviously wasn't done. Well, it could have been. Now that I think about it, if you read it, if he was, mm -hmm. if he was writing the psalm and reflecting back on what God told him, mm -hmm. uh, then it could have been written by David. He just, he just, he's just rehashing what God promised him. Right. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm, I mean, I have the. Yeah, here here it says that it's written by um, Ethan the Ezrite. Uh, so, you know, the, um, it doesn't claim to have Davidic authorship. So it's it's written. We don't know who uh, you know Ethan the Ezrite is, uh, the e Ezrachi. Uh, but yeah, so so we wouldn't we uh, it would it would be wrong to say it was written by David, Psalm eighty nine. But it's certainly written about David. Mm -hmm. And what and you're right, it it reflects exactly what the first reading says. It underlines the importance of the eternal promise given to David. So you can really see the mind of the church here. It's it wants us to share with people. God made a promise to David, and it would be fulfilled. And the promise is that there would always, for all of eternity, be a king on his throne. And that promise is fulfilled in Christ. That's what that's what we're celebrating when we celebrate Christmas and the kingdom of God and God's eternal kingship, which is only made possible through the coming of his Messiah. All right, let's go to Romans now. Let's go to Romans chapter 16, the very end of the book of Romans. To him who can strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret for long ages, but now manifested through the prophetic writings and according to the command of the eternal God, made known to all nations to bring about the obedience of faith. So the only wise God through Jesus Christ be glory forever and ever. Amen. Yeah. yeah. And so what does Paul mean about the mystery here? And, and part of the mystery is that the Gentiles are co-heirs with the Jews. That's part of the mystery. And another part of this mystery is that the Christ would have to suffer and die and be risen for, risen in glory. Um, and so. Paul spends a lot of time talking about this in the letter to the Romans. This, this is the very end of the letter to the Romans. And if you go all the way back to the beginning of the Romans, uh, Romans chapter 1, right around, around verses 5 and 6, Paul talks about the obedience of faith, okay? And at the very end, he talks about the command of the eternal God made known to, made known to all nations to bring about the obedience of faith. Uh, and here it's understood, you know, the obedience of faith in the sense that all nations would hear the gospel, repent, and believe in the Christ. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, expression that kind of it uh, kind of is like, you know, a um, it's it's a, it's a phrase that guides the the reader at the beginning of the letter to the Romans, and the letter ends with this same concept of the obedience of faith at the end of the letter to the Romans. And it's it's trying to help us to understand something about faith, that it's more than just a, a cerebral concept, but it, it, our faith must be a living faith. 
in Christ. It, it, it must be more than just, you know, something intellectually that I think about, but it's got to be a living faith in Christ. The faith, faith and works go hand in hand. It must be a living faith in Jesus our Lord, a faith that produces spiritual fruit. Um, and so, and so Paul ends this letter in this way, according to the gospel and proclamation of Jesus Christ. Now, the beginning of Romans, the first eight chapters, talks about the question of justification, justification through faith. And especially chapter eight, it's very important in that conversation if you want to understand Paul's argument, because it underlines life in the spirit, the continual walking with Jesus that we must do as faithful Catholic Christians. Um, and so uh, he ends he ends very simply talking about the mystery that has been revealed in Christ, that the Gentiles are co-heirs, that the Christ would have to come, he would have to suffer, die, and be risen from the dead. And then finally, the importance of this concept, the obedience of faith, that, that we would walk with Christ in faithful obedience. And I think during Christmas and Easter, we have many people who come to church uh, for the first time in a long time. And I think we want to find a loving way to challenge them, to say that, you know, we want to invite every single person to live the faith in the fullest way. And part of that is coming to Mass every Sunday, praying with your family, uh, living living a constant conversion in Christ where you're growing in the faith and turning away from sin, uh, learning how to develop a deep prayer life, uh, your own personal prayer life, and also a prayer life with your family if you have children. But we certainly want to uh, find a way to invite all who come on Christmas to come every single Sunday to Mass and 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 to come in a state of grace, to come so that they can receive Jesus in the Holy Eucharist, especially during this year that we place so much emphasis on the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Um, what would it what what would be the significance of this if we did not find a way to help people to come to Mass? every Sunday. So I think this is something that we could work on. We recently received the um, numbers for those who go to Mass every Sunday. Um, and if you look at the amount of Catholics in our diocese, there's over a million Catholics, like 1.3 million Catholics. And then if you look at the numbers, there's only maybe 180,000 that come every Sunday. So it gives you an idea of how much work we have if only one in five Catholics or four Catholics comes to Mass every Sunday, that means we've got our work cut out for us. And, and uh, how, but, the, but the real question is, how can we present the gospel to them so that they can understand it and, and mm -hmm. truly understand it as, as a gift, a true gift of God, but also a challenge as well uh, to follow Jesus? So any thoughts, Deacon? Um. Not, to, not, not that comes to mind right at the moment. I'm, mm -hmm. st I'm still playing with this one myself. So, but uh, exactly, it, it gives me, it gives me, gives me some food for thought. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is a it, challenge, it's, and mm -hmm. especially the challenge because we are challenged every time we 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 give a homily. We're part of a told or untold responsibilities to catechize those present. Mm -hmm. And I think Christmas time, when you get your mm -hmm. uh, CEOs that uh, mm -hmm. come, it's that is the absolute time to to tell them, hey guys, you're mm -hmm. missing out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, but the, the the real challenge is how do we how do how do we tell them in such a way that they can realize what this gift is, that and and also what the obligation is that we have as well. That's the that's the. That's the real challenge right there. All right. So um, let's now go to the gospel reading here, okay? Mm -hmm. um, in the gospel reading, we, we have the Annunciation, okay? Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the town of Galilee called Nazareth. Now, this is really interesting because in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, it was Gabriel who gave this very famous prophecy about 70 weeks, um, which many early church fathers saw as indicating the time period that would elapse from the time that the walls around Jerusalem were completed until the coming of Messiah, from, 
457, 458 BC, all the way to 33 uh, AD. If you do the math, it's 490 years. St. Jerome spends a lot of time talking about this, and he gives like five different ways of adding it up. And he basically says, you know what, any way you put it, any way you look at it, it has to be Jesus who came right at this specific time period. Uh, and what's amazing is Gabriel was the angel who gave that great prophecy to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. And it's the same Gabriel who comes to Mary in Luke chapter 1 to talk about the fulfillment of that promise. Okay, so that's the reason I bring up Daniel chapter 9, the 70 weeks, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. So he comes to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. Now, the, the word Nazareth, Netzeret, um, it's very close to another Hebrew word, Netzer, which means branch or shoot or skion. Uh, and the same word is used in Isaiah's great prophecy in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, where it talks about a shoot uh, or a branch coming forth from the stump of Jesse. Jesse. The David, the Davidic promise will be fulfilled, even though it looks like it's a cut down tree. Um, and if you're familiar with the Pieta, if you've ever seen the Pieta, look at it closely. You see Jesus resting on the lap of Mary. Uh, and the heel of his foot is resting on a stump. Uh, it's a direct reference back to that great promise in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 through 3. The, the shoot or stump coming forth from the, the shoot or the branch coming forth from the stump of Jesse. Uh, and so the virgin, Mary is described as a virgin. She's betrothed. She's in, a, she's in a legal engagement, but she is not yet joined together in a conjugal union. Very important point. So she's betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. Notice how uh, Luke tells you right away, Joseph has a Davidic background, okay? Uh, and the virgin's name is Mary, okay? Mary is the same word in Hebrew as Miriam, Miriam. It's the same word, Miriam and Mary. The, Miriam's the Hebrew Hebrew version. Okay, and coming to her, Gabriel says, and what does Gabriel say? Hail, full of grace. Now, this this greeting is probably the most unique greeting that we have in all of Scripture. Hail, full of grace. You don't find anything like this in the rest of in the rest of the Bible. You you can find something similar in Judges chapter six where an angel comes to Gideon and calls him a mighty warrior or a heroic warrior. Uh, in a similar way, Gabriel is greeting Mary with a title, okay? This is very important. He's not just greeting her, not saying, hey, Mary, how's it going today? No, he's greeting Mary with this title. Uh, the word hail right here, kyre, uh, it's also very important in the Old Testament because in some messianic prophecies, it relates to the coming of a new king. You can find this in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 through 10, and also in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 15. In Zechariah 9, it talks about the coming of a new Davidic king. In Zephaniah, it talks about God's kingship. But it's a word that's used to, um, um, uh, I guess you could say, call the attention to the reader uh, to prepare them for a proclamation about the Messiah's kingship and God's kingship, okay? So hail, and then full of grace. Uh, the, the verb that is used, it's used as a past per perfect participle. Uh, it's, it's underlining an ongoing action that is already past and continues, okay? It's a perfect past action that continues, and that's really beautiful. So uh, there's a lot of arguments over exactly how to translate that, you know, and it's, it's, it's so the, so, you know, some translate it highly favored, but it doesn't say anything about being highly favored. It has, it's really the most literal way you could translate it is hail the one who has been graced and continues to be graced. Okay. That would probably be a more literal uh, interpretation of it. Um, and so favor is a subset of grace. Okay, that's something to consider as well. Uh, so favor is not completely wrong, but it's more like a subset of grace. So hail the one who has been graced and continues to be graced. The Lord is with you. 
Now you can you notice that uh, certain parts of the Hail Mary here are you know we mm-hmm. we um, you know we we get those from Luke chapter one especially, and it says that she was greatly troubled at what was said, and she pondered what sort of greeting this might be. So. The greeting itself is very important because Mary doesn't yet understand why is an angel coming to me and greeting me this way with a title, okay? Um, And as I said, the only other place you can find a title being given in a special way is Judges chapter 6, when Gideon is called a mighty warrior. But here, hail full of grace. So the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Behold. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall na- and you shall name him Jesus. The word Jesus it literally means salvation, or uh, the Lord's salvation. Okay, our understanding of this is that the word was Yeshua. Okay, and Yeshua is a shortened version of the word for Joshua, which is Yehoshua. I know, I know that's a mouthful right there. And it goes on, it says, he will be great and he will be called son of the most high. So look at the things that were being told about Jesus. His name means salvation or um, literally the Lord's salvation. He will, be, he will be called the son of the most high. So this underlines that he's divine right here. He's called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. Notice that Gabriel underlines that Jesus will receive the throne of David, his father, that he will be a descendant of David, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. Now, Jacob is another name for Israel, Jacob and Israel. If you remember Jacob, he wrestled with the angel, and the angel named him Israel in the book of Genesis. You might remember that incident, okay? Um, and his And of his kingdom, there will be no end. In other words, it will be eternal. So in various ways, being called son of the most high, he's going to receive the Davidic throne. He's going to rule over the house of Jacob, which is also Israel, and his kingdom will have no end. That means it's an eternal kingdom. You can see how Gabriel fulfills all the um, expectations of the Davidic promise, which is the very first reading. Okay, So it's kind of like one, two, three, four, don't doubt this at all. Uh, every aspect of this Davidic dynastic promise will be fulfilled, okay? And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I have no relations with a man? Now, some some think that there is some implication of Mary's divinity here, possibly, because if she's betrothed and she's going to get married, then naturally she would say, wonderful, this will happen, you know, once we get married, it'll take place very shortly. But but she says something different. She says, how, you know, how is this going to happen? since I have no relations with a man. So this really, um, it's not a slam dunk in any way, but it, it really, uh, um, uh, you could say, provokes a lot of questions. Uh, did Mary, um, you know, in some way know that she um, would not have relations with Joseph? We don't have that information. Um, but this question is very provocative in that way. So the angel said to her in reply, here's how it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Now, this concept of of coming upon and overshadowing, we see this in the Old Testament, especially in relationship to the Ark of the Covenant. If If you remember how the presence of God overshadowed the Ark of the Covenant. And what's, what's so interesting is that the same verb is used in the Septuagint version if you look at the Septuagint version, chapter 40, right around verses 34 to 38, the exact same word is talked to, talk, uh, used to underline how God will overshadow the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. And the same concept is used to underline how God will overshadow our Blessed Mother Mary. Uh, and therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, the emphasis on Jesus' identity as the Son of God uh, it recalls the promise that the king would be considered a son of God. But Jesus is more than the son of God because he's also, if you go back here a little bit, uh, he is the son of the most high God. Okay, so in a, in a special way, it's he's differentiated. Of course, we know that he is the only begotten son. He's the son of God from all of eternity, um, as opposed to us who received this, this title of 
sons and daughters of God in a, in a certain way. Uh, Paul explains how we have this status, which uh, he, he ties to the concept of adoption. We've been brought into the family of God through Christ. Okay, and so he goes on and, and he says, And behold, Elizabeth, your relative has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called barren. So we know that this is happening six months later, for mm -hmm. nothing will be impossible for God. And so Mary's response is very simple. She gives what we call her fiat. You might you might know this. Um, she gives. We're not talking about the car. We're talking about Mary basically saying, let it be done to me. Let it be done unto me. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed her. So there's much you can say here about the message of the gospel being proclaimed by an angel, uh, Mary giving her fiat or giving, giving her whole self to God's promise, uh, and especially the identity of Jesus as the son of God, as the son of David, uh, his, his rightful rule over the throne of David for all of eternity, and receiving a kingdom that will have no end. Uh, anything you want to add to this, uh, Deacon? Um, scroll down a little bit, Father. A little bit more. I just, um, it's the very last part. The part that I always like to behold, I, the handmaid of the Lord may be done to me according to your will. Nothing will be impossible for God. And I think that that is something that can't be said enough to some people, especially if they're going through trials and tribulations. Nothing is impossible for God. Even though you, you, I've had people who said, "I don't, I don't, I'm ready to give up. God's not with me." Oh no, He's there, and He can. He nothing's impossible for God. We don't understand His plan for us necessarily, but uh, if we have a faithful obedience, as you put it, or emphasized faithful obedience, uh, nothing is impossible. Okay, beautiful. All right, thank you. And so mm -hmm. now we're going to go to some of the Christmas readings right here. And so uh, the first one we'll hit is the Vigil Mass. And so in recent years, the Vigil Mass has become the most popular Christmas <laughs> celebration. So I think it's important that we hit these readings because uh, this is where in some churches, most of the people come on the Vigil. Okay. So so I don't know. It just seems like in recent years, the Vigil has taken over. It, uh, um, so, it's certainly true at Holy Trinity. <laughs> yeah, it's most churches. So anyhow, the very first reading from Isaiah 62, I, I love it because it says, For Zion's sake, I will not be silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet. What a beautiful image of God saying, I will do something to save my people. I'm not going to be quiet. Quiet. Uh, until her vindication shines forth like the dawn and her victory like a burning torch. And so it's God saying, I'm not going to be quiet. I'm going to act on behalf of my people. I'm, I'm going to do something to change their situation. Uh, and it goes on, nations shall behold your vindication and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name pronounced by the mouth of God. You should be a glorious crown in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem held by your God. No more sh shall people call you forsaken or your land desolate, but you should be called my delight and your land espoused. Now, if you remember the Israelites, they were taken away to exile. Well, the, the kingdom of Israel was completely destroyed, 722 BC. The kingdom, kingdom of Judah was taken into exile and Here's the Lord giving this great promise to them. You're never going to be forsaken. Your land is never going to be desolate. Uh, and when they came back from exile, it was kind of like the glass is half full and it's also half empty. Uh, they had a temple, which they rebuilt, but it was nothing like the first temple. There was no Ark of the Covenant in that second temple. They had no divisible, they had no visible king on the throne of David. So there were many promises that were just simply not realized yet. So the, the sense was that there, there's still something else for God to do. He, he can't remain silent. He must continue to, to act on our behalf. And of course, the, the church understands that this is exactly what happened. The Lord sent his own son 
to come to give his life for our salvation. For Zion's sake, I will not be silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet. Um, and so the coming of the Christ, Jesus' coming is, is God's ultimate here. Look, I'm not going to. I'm not going to, you know, just be neutral. I'm going to act on your behalf. And so we have this image of as a young man marries a virgin, your builder shall marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall your God rejoice in you. Now, what is this all about? You know, your builder marrying you and a bridegroom rejoicing in his bride. The, the covenant is seen as a sacred marriage between mm -hmm. God and his people. It's likened to a sacred marriage between God and his people. And Isaiah is underlining this theme that God is going to make a new covenant with his people. The bridegroom who is Christ is going to rejoice over his bride, which is his church. All right, any thoughts on this reading, Deacon? Mm, not particularly, yeah, um, very familiar, very profound. Um, Nothing that really uh, I can add on to what you've already said. So, okay, very good. All right, I, and I and I I'm guessing that the church chose this reading because just as Israel had to recognize God's work that God would not be silent, mm -hmm. so for Christmas when we celebrate Christmas when we celebrate the birth of Christ, we have to recognize God's great work as well. So now we have Psalm 89 again. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord. I've made a covenant with my chosen one. I've sworn to David, my servant, forever I will confirm your posterity and establish your throne for all generations. Now, do you notice something? Yeah, that it we, goes back to the first reading of the fourth yeah, Sunday. We, we have the exact same responsorial psalm. So, you know, if we're preaching uh, on the fourth Sunday and also if we're preaching on Christmas, if you have mass in the morning and mass in the evening, well, you already know what's responsorial psalm you can mention in both of your homilies, okay? Yeah. It's the exact same responsorial psalm. So maybe the church was trying to say, hey, let's be let's be gracious to them that, that weekend. They've got a lot to, to think about. Uh -huh. uh, our, our second reading is from Acts. Uh, it says, when Paul reached Antioch in Poseidon, this is a different Antioch. This is not the one that's on the coast of the Mediterranean or near the coast of the Mediterranean. This is more, more inland. inland. Um, and so Paul reached Antioch in Poseidon, and he entered the synagogue, and he stood up, and he motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you others who are God-fearing, listen, the God of this people, Israel, chose our ancestors and exalted the people during their sonjur in the land of Egypt. With uplifted arm, he led them out of it. Then he removed Saul and raised up David as king. Of him he testified, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will carry out my every wish. Now, this is a very famous line in Psalm 89. If you go to Psalm 89, verses 20 to 25, it underlines how God literally found David. And it, it, finding David doesn't mean that David was lost. What it means is that that God chose him. Uh, and he, even though he was a person that the world could not recognize, he just didn't look like a king. He, um, he was anointed as a king. He went to Saul uh, and he spent most of his early years uh, playing um, the harp for Saul when Saul was enraged. Uh, and so he was he was the anointed king. Saul's kingship had been rejected. But his own family, the people of Israel, and even Saul himself did not recognize David's kingship. Uh, from this man's descendants, God, according to his promise, has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus. John heralded his coming by proclaiming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And it goes on, it says, as John was completing his course, he would say, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he. Behold, one is coming after me. I am not worthy to unfasten the sandals of his feet. Now, this is this is so beautiful because in a very simple way, Paul simply underlines that the great Davidic promise is fulfilled in Jesus, our Lord, mm -hmm. and that John came as a precursor. In the, in the early church, 
Scholars believe that John the Baptist was very well known publicly, possibly famous, and even more well known than Jesus because ancient writings, for instance, if you look at the writings of um, Flavius Josephus, uh, Flavius Josephus, who lived a little after the time of Christ, he talks more about John the Baptist than he does about Jesus. Really interesting. Uh, so he's kind of a temporary. He, he lived through the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, and so he would have been a young man at the time that Jesus was crucified. But he, he talks so much about John the Baptist and not as much about Jesus. So some scholars think that John the Baptist was, wow, he was really famous. He was very well known. And here's Paul underlining, John said, one is coming after me, and I am not unworthy to unfasten the sandals of his feet. So this reading really underlines the Davidic promise and especially John's humility. Any thoughts, Deacon? Um, it just sounds a little bit familiar for the third Sunday of Advent. <laughs> What was where was it? It's not, it was it was down below, I think. Where when I, when when we yeah, that third Sunday of Advent. That's what it, that's because because I, I just finished doing that gospel yesterday. <laughs> John says I'm not worthy to untie. The... Yeah, yeah, it's exactly you know, and well, the reason is is because Luke is the author of Acts of the Apostles. So on the third Sunday of Advent, we had a reading from the Gospel of Luke. Which, which was written by Luke. Mm -hmm. And now for Christmas, we have a reading which is from Acts of the Apostles, which is also written by Luke. So notice how he's uh, he uses the exact same phrase uh, in both uh, to talk about John the Baptist saying, I'm not worthy to unfasten the sandals of his feet. Yeah, you're right. It was it was yes, it was in yesterday's it reading. Blend, it blends yeah. in very nicely. Yes, yes. Well, one more reason to underline Luke and authorship and Acts of the Apostles. All right. Uh, and so the gospel acclamation, uh, tomorrow the wickedness of the earth will be destroyed. The Savior of the world will reign over us. Alleluia, alleluia. And then we have the very famous reading from the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I love I, That's good because I'm going to have to read it. I have every year I have trouble with those yeah. names. Well, you know, I'll tell you this. I'll, I'll tell you there's something very important about the genealogy because um, the genealogy, it's divided into three groups of 14, 14, 14, 14. The last one uh, debatably is 13, depending on how you how you how you read it. But the long story short is that 14 is a special number because it is the same number of David's name. All the letters had a numerical value. So the name of David uh, was equivalent to 14, Dalit, Bob, da, uh, Dalit. And so essentially the, the, um, the uh, sum of those letters is 14. And so it's kind of like Matthew is saying 14, 14, 14. Do you guys remember David? Do you remember that promise? Uh, and also he starts with Abraham. So he starts with Abraham. Why does he start with Abraham? Because Matthew wants to focus on two great promises. He wants to focus on Jesus as the son of David. That's the first great promise, the dynastic promise. And then he wants to focus on Jesus as the son of Abraham. Uh, what was the promise that God made to Abraham? You can find that in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, chapter 18, uh, verse 18, and chapter 22, verses 17 through 18. And Essentially, God promised that through Abraham, he, through his descendant, singular, he would bless all the nations of the earth. Uh, that's a very that's much clearer in uh, Genesis 18, 18 and Genesis 22, 17 to 18. Through his descendant, singular, he would bless all the nations of the earth. And who is this descendant? The descendant is the Christ. Uh, in Hebrew, the word for seed is Zerah, Zerah. Um, and, you know, just like English, you can have singular plurals. Uh, so just like you say, you know, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, you could, it could be either singular or it could be plural depending on the context. OK, mm -hmm. so Matthew wants to wants to start off by re by referring to Jesus as the son of David and the son of the son of Abraham. 
And so his genealogy begins with Abraham. And if you look at it closely, it begins with Abraham. And then it's then the, the next group of 14 begins with David. Notice that. Okay. And so there's a special place for it, David. And then after that, it begins with the Babylonian exile. Okay. And then finally with the birth of Jesus, who is called the Christ. Okay. Uh, and so, so three fourteens uh, are significant as well because it's kind of like saying good, better, best. Uh, this is the par excellence David. This is the most perfect David, the fulfillment of the promises made to David. So having three fourteens is also important. Uh, and that's why Matthew says the total number of generations from Abraham to David is 14 generations. From David to the Babylonian exile, 14 generations. From the Babylonian exile to the Christ, 14 generations. So do you see what, what Matthew is doing? Matthew wants the reader to notice 14, 14, 14, so they, they could understand that, wow, this promise is being fulfilled by the descendant of David, who is the Christ, a descendant of Abraham and a, a descendant of David. Uh, and then finally, you have the information about the birth of Jesus, okay? Before they lived together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Um, and Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to, to shame. So he decided to separate from her, divorce her quietly. Um, so you have to remember that they, they were legally betrothed to one another, but they were not in a conjugal union. This was just a tradition of the time period where there was like, there was like this legal understanding that took place before they actually came together in a conjugal union. And so such was the intention when, behold, the angel Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said to him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. This is a work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' conception. And she will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus. Notice that, it, that the Lord is helping Joseph to understand his will here. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is really important for us. We have to constantly discern the Lord's will, seeking to understand his will. But notice, he's going to bear a son. His name will be Jesus. The word Jesus means salvation. And he's going to save his people from their sins. This is a very special promise in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, that God would make a new covenant with his people and he would remember their sins no more. What a beautiful promise. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. And th there's a special emphasis on Jesus coming to save us from our sins, to give mm -hmm. his life for our salvation. And all this takes place to fulfill what had been said through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel. Of course, the word Emmanuel means yeah, God is with it. us. Um, and Matthew translate it, translates it, which means God is with us. And so Joseph awoke and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took his wife into his home. And he had no relations with her until she bore a son, and he named him Jesus. Now, the word, the word for until in Greek, it's very important. It does not mean that they had relations afterwards. It, it just means like up to this point. Uh, so many English readers uh, misinterpret this very special Greek word. Uh, in the early church, St. John Christensen, who was an expert in the Greek language, he you know had all this advanced study in Greek. Uh, he writes a very short paragraph explaining this. I can include it in the notes for you, but it doesn't mean that they had relations afterwards, okay? Uh, it's just, it's, it's simply the narrative is underlining that there were no relations, uh, uh, there were no relations up to this point, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, it doesn't imply that something happened afterwards. But anyhow, I, I think it's an important point to make because it's one of those things where when you're translating a foreign language, you can misunderstand what that language means if you do a direct word-for-word -word translation, which is what we have in English. We have a word-for-word -word translation. Uh, it's, you know, but often uh, it, does, it doesn't really capture the full, the full significance. The meaning and the intent. Yeah, exactly. So... Uh, that's just something to to consider. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts, uh, Deacon? No, sir. All right. There's a lot here. 
Yeah, and there's yeah. much more to there's much much more to say with our readings this this Christmas. So we just pray that all of our churches are immensely blessed during this Christmas season, uh, and uh, that we preach the word with all confidence and all fullness. Uh, we pray for the conversion of sinners. We especially pray that many who come to church for the first time would uh, change their lives, and they would begin to come every Sunday and participate in the community and be, uh, begin to participate fully in, in the life of faith and in the life of their local church. All right, would you like to close with a, uh, close us with a closing prayer, Deacon? I sure will. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and break open your word. We, we hope and pray, especially myself, that you will guide me in my preparation for this coming weekend and that the, that your word through me can be given out to those who will, should be and hopefully will be listening and then adhering to the word. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right. Thank you so much. Have a blessed week. And Merry Christmas to you, Father. Merry Christmas to you too.